Up to 200 youth may have been sexually abused at Nova Scotia Youth Detention Facility. Neo-Nazi is being sentenced and the judge questions the prosecution's request for a short sentence. Wealthy man summoned to talk to the Auditor General in Ontario tries to weasel out of it. Heavy rains in Cote d'Ivoire have killed 30 people and Colombia and Brazil are on target to reduce Amazon deforestation. Good morning. It's Thursday, July 13th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. There's really shocking news to start with this morning. The Halifax Examiner's Tim Bousquet is reporting that more than 70 children were sexually assaulted at the Nova Scotia Youth Centre and that there are likely more, as many as 200 people estimated to have survived the abuse. The abuse happened between 1988, when it first opened, and 2017. The centre is a youth jail and located in Waterville. In 2019, four men filed a lawsuit saying that they had been sexually abused at the facility. Despite what Bousquet calls, quote, sporadic reports of abuse at the facility, unquote, there had not been enough evidence to press charges before this lawsuit. But thanks to the lawsuit, the RCMP started a full investigation. It is bizarre that it took a lawsuit to even trigger all of this. It is a public facility, and this kind of rampant abuse should have probably been investigated even if the evidence was scant. All of the 70 cases already identified have been among men, but police haven't ruled out that there might be women who come forward. Despite calling a press conference to announce what they have learned so far, the police didn't give any details about who may have committed the sexual assaults. In the lawsuit, the men had indicated that they had been abused by a swim coach, but he is not named in the lawsuit. Bousquet reports how you can be in touch if you have information about any other sexual assaults that happened there. He writes this, quote, Operation Headwind has established a hotline. It's 902-720-5313 with a toll-free number of 1-833-314-3475. A person will answer the line between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. local time, and people can leave a confidential voicemail outside of those hours. Additionally, investigators can be contacted by email at headwind at rcmp-grc.gc.ca. Next to Montreal, where Gabriel Sohir Chaput, a neo-Nazi who's been found guilty of promoting hatred against Jews, is back in court to be sentenced. Chaput was a key neo-Nazi web writer for a website that is widely read among neo-Nazis in the English-speaking world. It's called The Daily Stormer. He wrote more than 800 pieces for the site and was charged earlier this year for that. Now, here's where this whole situation is a bit strange. The prosecution has asked for just three months of jail time for Sheput. Usually, the prosecution is the side that's asking for the harsher sentence. It's strange enough that the judge, Menlio Del Negro, challenged the prosecution to explain why they were asking for such a low sentence. Del Negro said, quote, with respect, the sentence that you're suggesting trivializes the crime, unquote. The judge cited several cases where six months and one year prison sentences were imposed for similar crimes. Chaput repeatedly claimed that his writing was supposed to be read in jest or ironically, and that he didn't mean to do hate crimes, something that Del Negro rejected. He's expected to render his sentence on September 22nd. Next to Ontario, where Silvio de Gasparis, one of the province's wealthiest and most politically connected men, is trying to have a summons quashed or suspended to avoid answering to the province's auditor general. De Gasparis is the president of TAC Group. They are developers who stand to make a stupid amount of money off of developing the Green Belt in Ontario. The Green Belt is protected land that encircles the greater Toronto area from development because of its rich soil and natural elements. The Auditor General, Bonnie Lysick, has been examining why the government removed nearly 3,000 hectares from 15 areas along the Green Belt so that 50,000 homes could be built. Lysik summoned de Gasparis to provide the documents related to his companies that were removed from the Greenbelt. She wants to know how the government identified TAC Group lands to be removed from the Greenbelt specifically and generally how this decision happened. De Gasparis is arguing that he doesn't have that information. He's also arguing that Lysik does not have the authority to issue such a summons. Lysik is supposed to be auditing what the value for money was that removing these parcels of land from the Greenbelt. Her term is up on September 3rd. 
Now, this is why this all matters. From CBC's Ryan Patrick Jones, quote, the de Gasparis brothers have been prolific political contributors to Ontario political parties, with the majority of donations made since 2014 going to the Press of Conservative Party of Ontario. TAC companies have also hired lobbyists with ties to the PC government. The lobbyist registry shows, although none of the records indicate that they are hired to influence decisions in the Greenbelt, unquote. Now, of course, they wouldn't say that. But they're very close friends with the premier of the province, and so none of this is all that surprising. Next to Côte d'Ivoire, where at least 30 people have died due to torrential rains that have fallen since April. 22 of those deaths have happened in the city of Abidjan. Six million people live in Abidjan, and many of the residences are precarious structures in flood zones. Rains have caused major damage to people's homes. Some of the structures, particularly informal ones, are going to be torn down and others will need to be reinforced. In June alone, 300 millimeters of rain fell. That's the equivalent to 3,000 centimeters of snow in a single month. I don't know why I understand that better with snow, but maybe you do too. This isn't the first time that ceaseless rains have killed people in Cote d'Ivoire. Rain was blamed on 19 deaths last year. And finally, good news from Colombia and Brazil, where deforestation has fallen to its lowest level in many years. In Colombia, it's its lowest level in almost 10 years. In 2022, deforestation dropped by 29%. The information was released by Colombia's government. The gains were notably made in the Amazon rainforest. Environment Minister Suhana Mohammed told journalists that they were above their target this year in halting deforestation. She said that the big question going forward is whether or not they can sustain this in the next few years. Fighting deforestation has been a priority of President Gustavo Petro, who has also wanted to strengthen environmental protection. He encouraged wealthier nations to cancel foreign debt in exchange of ensuring greater investment in protecting the Amazon. Because really, we really, really need the Amazon to not be destroyed. In Brazil, Lula has also tried to stop deforestation. He's cracked down on illegal logging and forest degradation. In Brazil, deforestation in the Amazon fell by 34% in the first half of 2023, a low for the last four years. Lula, like Petro, has also asked for international help. Lula's strategy has been through a fund that helps Brazil pay to protect the forest. Germany has pledged $38 million to the fund already, and the UK has promised $101 million. It's dangerous work to protect the Amazon, and indigenous groups are usually the ones who experience violence for trying to protect the forest. Al Jazeera reminds that police believe that Bruno Pereira and Dom Williams were murdered in the Amazon because they happened upon an illegal fishing scheme in the Javari Valley. The Javari Valley is protected indigenous territory in western Brazil. Illegal gold mining in Yanomami territory has created a humanitarian crisis among the Yanomami people. Those are your headlines for Thursday, July 13th. I'm Nora. You're listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News podcast feed and syndicated on campus stations across Canada. I hope you have a great Thursday.